All right, here we are again with David DeHai from RF Shop in Australia. David, welcome back to the show, man. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate the time again. Ah, super psyched. So we awesome. did a show, I think last week might have been a little bit, I think it was last mm -hmm. week, on yes. kind of ra general radio stuff. Super good response. People were really excited about that. And then yep. you and I started talking, I think you had suggested doing something on cable, on cables that and cable good. loss and how cables work, because it's a question that both of us get asked a ton, and at least you're in a, in a position to, to masterfully answer it. So I figured yes. what we'd do with this is go through a bunch of questions and ask you the kind yep. of common cable questions I have and, mm -hmm. and go from there. Mm -hmm. I think bef before we start, it is, uh, as, as I always say, tell people, or, or cables is not the most exciting topic that exists in the yeah. world. but you spend so much time on an antenna and you spend a lot of dollars on your equipment, in this case, helium miners, but it could be any router or any device. Yep. That link between the two, if that's a poor quality or you make poor decisions, um, it could just kill everything. So as much as we focus on the antenna so much, the cables is the link. It literally can be the missing link. So that, that's my context of where I am with these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess we start with the the cable that comes with a lot of um, a lot of the miners, which is a really thin cable. It looks a lot like the your kind of headphone yeah, cable. A little example, yes. So it's really it's about three millimeter thin. So yes, correct. Yeah, and how does that compare to let's say the the other kind of um, standard, which we'll we'll talk about why that might not be the best choice, which is LMR four hundred, which mm -hmm. is a lot thicker. What is that? A, a, well, it's a couple. Well, literally, there, there's there's an example. So you, you sit with a one is three millimeter thick, and the other one has a ten mil diameter. Um, I mean, the the first obvious difference between the two is the losses is just worlds apart. So you have quite a significant loss on the um, the small cable, and it gets used a lot. Even in I mean, it's a lot you see a lot of people online opening their miners to to look at either the electronics or to check the connectors in there, the UFL connectors that goes into the little boards. Um, so for the short runs, they are needed. You have to because you can't bend these cables all that well. I mean, it's it's hard enough to make a coil like this. Um, but that's for the short, very short runs. But yep. for the long yep. runs, and then helium seems like every run, that's what people want to do. And I understand how people um, you know, want to do that. It's better to go for lower loss so you at least get as much energy as you can from point A to B. Now, either you send to the antenna or the antenna needs to receive into your minor and lower losses through these cables makes makes a difference yeah so is let's see let's go to kind of the basics is is that as that energy travels from the minor to the antenna or from the antenna to the minor for transmitters or receive there's a an energy loss along that path and it's, I mean, it's pretty straightforward stuff the thinner the cable the more energy gets lost probably because the less efficient it is is that right yeah mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yes and, and if the power you lose, just goes, go goes away. It goes nowhere. So you just lose it. It's just gone. It's gone. Yeah, Rad it radiates. I mean, I think of it. It's probably wrong, but I think of it like heat. Is that if you have this tiny little thing, it's really hard to keep a lot of heat in. If you have a nice thick thing, you got insulation and you can keep the heat in. It's probably wrong, but that's how I think of it. Well, I think yeah. If it's scientifically, it's maybe not absolutely correct. But for a lot of people who relate to things, that is that is a, a good analogy of what happens. It, it just goes away. Um, Sorry, slight deviation, but there is a project we're working on where um, there are issues with a, a 200 watt transmitter um, and the cable heats up. So <laughs> it's almost there is a relationship between yeah. the two. The heat is just the losses right. go somewhere and it goes into the actual um, cable itself. So I'm pointing to the cable here. So this yeah. is my, my, um, yeah. my go to point. Um, so the losses doesn't just disappear into thin air. The energy goes somewhere. And if you're talking about systems that have watts like uh, 200 watts of power it it converts to heat so it, it, the analogy is not that um far okay off. hey maybe i maybe i'm more correct than i thought cool <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> great it's always nice when you're accidentally right okay yeah. um <laughs> so we got the thin stuff we got the thick stuff the thick stuff is better the downside of the thick stuff is that it's more expensive um mm -hmm. and the other downside is that as you'd said it's it's much less flexible you can't okay. usually you can't um really flex it around to get into small spaces or go around sharp curves or anything that's like great. that. That's great. And then I, th I think, well, okay, there are thicker cables as well in, in um, cable world. As you know, LMR 600, 800, 900, um, they're all thicker. Um, in, in, in our 4G world where we um, you know, spend a lot of time as well, we actually don't want to just go for the thick stuff because it's impractical. Okay. Um, so we really think about what's a customer's 
practical setup as well. If they only want five meter, I know in helium it's it's slightly different because we are doing hotspots, so you actually want to build a network. But if you're an end user, you just think about yourself. It's kind of a little bit selfish, but it is how you can think about it when you are a 4G customer and you just say, I'm, I just need to connect to somebody else's network. Yep. Five meter, 10 meter, we actually go for thinner cable than the 400 and it's more than good enough for that setup. So we think practical, thickness, how how much can you do with it? I personally love the, two, the 240 range because it actually is a little bit lower loss than the classic um, uh, with a five mil cable, mm -hmm. but it is already much better. So there's this almost a happy medium between 400 and the 195s, which is the, the two common. Is the 240, yeah. The 240 is, and the connectors are very common as well. And that's another thing that um, LMR 300 exists. It's so uncommon to get the connectors is very tough. So we actually, when customers say, oh, I want 300 because it's a little bit better than 240. Um, so uh, it's hard to get the connectors. Let's stick to something that has mainstream connectors. Yep. Um, and the, the same with the helium. If you stick to 400, everybody does 400 size cable. It becomes very easy to support the inquiries. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I've got, I got 240 and 400 in the garage. I've worked with both of them. I don't think I've ever seen mm. 300. So good to know mm. that it exists. Mm. Um, so one of the common but, questions that, uh, that we get, both of us, is... When you have a long cable run and you've got loss, whether that's 2B, 2DB or 4 or DBM, sorry, um, or whatever it is, how does that loss affect the radiation pattern or the, the performance of the antenna? Okay. Yeah, um, on the radiation pattern, it actually only scales the size down. Um, and I do get this question a lot. I had it last week again. I tried to explain it on email. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably just really try to paint the picture now that – Yeah. To complicate things, you get a 6 dBi and you get a 9 dBi Omni. In the helium, we all know those are the kind of two old, typical options that you have. Sure. A 6 dBi has a certain radiation pattern, so I just go like this. It's nice and wide, 30 degree kind of beam width. Yep. And a 9 dBi antenna has 10 dB bandwidth, uh, beam width. Yep. If you now say, okay, but you are losing cable and what effectively comes out of the antenna is not 9, but now it becomes 6, it has nothing to do with the radiation pattern. It's just you have this antenna, it looks like this towards the field, and when you have losses, cable losses, suddenly it's just a smaller version. Like it's still there. I didn't just do weaker. this. I just I just it's it's the, the same thing, but it's just shrinking the size. So physically you're just changing the reach and that's basically all it is. You don't change anything on the antenna. The antenna is what it is. It's always there the way it is. You just make it weaker in terms of performance. Okay, let's let's actually take a look at the some of the patterns we were looking at before because it may help to um, mm -hmm. to share that. So let's see if I can bring that up. I think here we go. This might be the Chrome. Yeah, this might be a tab. So when we're looking at um, an antenna, one of the first things I get lots of questions like, "Hey, is this antenna any good?" And they found like a fourteen dollar antenna on eBay or Amazon or whatever. I think the very first step is not necessarily the price because maybe there's a super cheap uh, supplier out there. But yep. look to see if there is um, this guy right here, which is the the pattern of the antenna. And if the antenna yep. doesn't have a pattern with it that you can look at, it's probably not worth buying because there's no, you have no idea what you're getting, right? There's like not even a promise there from the manufacturer. That, that that's correct. So okay. you you definitely have a safeguard when you look at the radiation pattern that it it matches your expectations. Um, you get the exception to the rule where people could just copy and paste a radiation sure. pattern as well. But that's I think. The really dodgy antennas, if I call it that way, they wouldn't bother doing that. So right. and that is important. And, and the picture that you have on the screen does not change with cable losses. So the intensity changes, but not the, the shape. Okay. So let's go through the picture that we're looking at. We might as well might as well knock this out. I think we talked about it last time, but didn't have a picture. Is that hmm. this is an H antenna. Any good antenna is, is going to be fine. This is certainly not the only antenna out there. Every time I talk about this as a good antenna, someone comes up and yeah, is yeah. like, why do you have this fascination? And I'm like, they're just good <laughs> enough antennas. They do a great job, um, but it's not the only option out there. But for right now, we'll just that focus on the pattern. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this pattern here, which is the, the center of generally my screen, is we got two lines. One is the blue line that's all the way around it. And one is this red line that looks a little bit like two ears or lobes or, well, technically they are lobes. Sure, Those sure. are representing two different things. Uh, yes. David, do you want to kind of walk through what those two things represent and how to think about it? 
Yeah, so I think the key to that is actually that little table or the um, legend at the top right of what you have there, which says elevation and azimuth. Yep. Those are just fancy words to look at. Elevation, that actually is a common word, so it's just how, how the antenna looks when you um, go put it put it up right so you ins install the antenna like the image you have on the left so it's just there it's a dome it stands like a like a um a light or so it's, it just stands yeah. so now you can basically virtually take the antenna and position it into the middle of that ball and for elevation what you have is the antenna is standing up right yeah. and you have a radiation pattern that it goes up and it then looks at the horizon. It's a little bit above the horizon, I see in this case. Um, it, is, it is at its best. And then as you go look, look down towards the bottom, so say you have a, it's on the top of your building, then you look towards the ground, you actually will see what is below 180 degree or so about below the horizon. So those are the, the kind of expectation you can get. So the antenna gain is it's it, at a peak, at in this case, about 10, 15 degrees. So there's the horizon. I'm looking a little bit up. And you can see the antenna is at its peak. It's at its best. Yep. And then when you go down, it's a bit weaker. And then when you go up and down, it's from where you are. So you, you installed your antenna here on the roof. I'm standing on it. Yep. Looking up, it's at its weakest. There's an absolute dip. So you can see it's not doing much to the top. Yep. And it's not doing anything, well, even worse to the bottom, which is what you want. So it's not a problem. It's just a, a comment about the antenna. Um, that's elevation. On azimuth, which is an, an antenna engineering word for looking around the antenna so now you just have to change your perspective of the antenna so now you have the antenna looking as if it's kind of into the screen or pointing out to whichever way so it could be you're just looking at it from from the top um and because it's almost a perfect circle it i mean it's never perfect but it's very close to perfect circle and, and in antenna design terms that is a very good omni antenna omni means omni is everywhere wherever you go if you look around it, it does the same thing and that's really what you want in an omni antenna you want to see the same everywhere because you don't want to have to guess is it better to this direction than to my back or to my left or my right um that's what an omni does for you it, it that's the ideal and that's the perfect picture you have for somebody that says i'm in the middle of um the city i have miners in this case or hotspots all around me if i put this on top i can see the same i can send everybody around me exactly the same signal signal quality Yep. Dig it. Uh, I think, I don't know if sense? I can, yeah, totally. Um, I don't know if it jumps over. Are we now seeing, you, you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. So this is a, a very different antenna. Yes. Yes. I see that. This is a directional antenna. And now we're looking at two, two of the same things just to represent it differently. There's not a blue line and a red line now. There's the, and they're not called, um, what was it? The uh, vertical and horizontal. Yeah. They're vertical. Mm. That's a good good example of how, how things can be called differently, and we're still talking about the same thing. Um, so just one last remark then about the H antenna that you had before. It's because it's an omni and because it's not a lot of weird information in the omni direction, in the circle. Yep. That this gets done a lot, so it makes the presentation so much simpler. So you can have two sets of data on one plot because it's it's quite easy to see between the two and, and to distinguish. I'm mentioning this because on the directional antenna, which is the other plot that you have there, there's a lot of information to be digested in both axes. And that's why it's not a, not a good idea for this plot to be on one. Um, this, mm. Just to say why, why you would have two in this one and one plot with two sets of data on the other one. Now, this would be different between probably any antenna that, that somebody would present to you so you need to really look at this and just look at this from a perspective of is this important to me is this what i want to do right um i am very used to the azimuth and elevation terminology yeah because that, that's how that's where i i'd say grow up i guess when, when i did antenna design that's how always how we spoke vertical and horizontal i actually just have to think a little bit about this as well but if you look at the antenna it's a mix between polarization and orientation of the antenna so you kind of have to split the two and that's why in pure raw antenna design they you know, if i put that hat on we we always call it differently just to not get confused but in vertical you look at the antenna as if it's it's upright mm -hmm. vertical and by having it upright now i look at the plot on the left and i could see i'm pointing say into the screen or to the to the right on that specific plot that's it. how yeah. high and how low to the right of my plot is this thing still working quite well? And you can see it's really 
quite a focused beam in the forward direction. So what this antenna does, I, I don't know the detail of the actual antenna itself, but you can see by the plot what it does. It really takes all the energy and rather than the Omni that just kind of you try to manage everything going everywhere. This one in elevation, which in this case is vertical, we say, okay, all the energy, I want to move forward. So it really has this nice scan of the horizon and everything that, that happens is straightforward in, into your that forward direction. Um, another thing on that plot, you will see those little lobes that you have. We call them side lobes. And there's also one going to the opposite direction to the back. We call that a back lobe. That little aspect is actually, to me, super critical and important when people start to talk about this whole overshooting and then is my antenna overshooting and all that stuff, no plot, if, if you simplify these plots, um, people always just have a, a straight line. So, well, it just goes that way. Nobody ever mentions the fact that there's actually a lot of energy going in all other directions. And that's yeah. just physics. Um, it's like literally like spraying water when you have a perfect um, spray that you want to you know, spray your son because he's, he's naughty. Yeah. There's a lot of potential you get back spray. And back spray is that. It, it, it is there. You can't get away from that. But if this whole conversation about overshooting happens, do not forget there are side lobes. And that side lobe goes in all the other directions and there's useful energy. So yeah. it's it's actually sometimes a problem, sometimes not. And we, we try to get that as low as possible. I mean, what you have there is a phenomenal little antenna. So I, that's, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, and yeah. you just try to eliminate those side lobes, have everything on the horizon. The other plot, the um, the one on the other side, is now what we call the horizontal. So, as I said, this has a nice beam forward, but it actually is quite broad over the horizon. So, it's it's actually a really handy little antenna to have because you are getting gain off this antenna, which I think we said is 13 dBi gain. Yep. Um, by flattening the horizon, but you still have this nice um, coverage over the horizon. So, I would, I would use this type of antenna if you say somebody who are... Um, at the back of a, a mountain or this you, you're facing the sea, it's kind of pointless to point everything towards the sea with an omni antenna because there's nobody going to be there. So you turn it around and you say, well, this antenna then sends all the energy in the forward direction. Um, and while it's doing that, it's no use me going up and down too high. So I, I narrow the beam. And with that balloon uh, demonstration that, or example that I referred to in my own channel and also last week when I mentioned that. Yep. Basically, that energy, you just force it all in one direction. And if you can flatten that like we do in a vertical, it just goes forward. So the more you can eliminate from going in the wrong directions, the better you can get your forward gain going. So this antenna is with a plot on the left, flat, but it's scanning quite nicely on the horizon. So you have a, quite a nice um, coverage in front of you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, just, it's a high gain antenna. I've used this. Um, I've, I've used this, and I've used the three dBi. I don't notice any difference in H and T earnings performance. Um, yeah. This one is more of a, a pain in the ass to move around. So I, I guess can imagine yeah. the the one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> this thing is it's pretty big. I got a funny video somewhere of me carrying the thing. Um, <laughs> so the way I look at it with cable loss to go back to our <laughs> what I what I think both of us are like, oh, let's talk about cable loss. We end up talking about antennas. Yeah, is, <laughs> talk about cable loss. We spent five minutes on a good antenna. Yeah, is is I think of the pattern won't change. It's just the strength anywhere in that pattern will change. So, however you measure strength, we could just use whatever five units. If you yes. have a five unit strength out here normally, and then you have a bunch of cable loss because you have a hundred feet of LMR four hundred, and that removes two units of that loss, you'll still have the same power. It's just that instead of it being five units of power or whatever the thing is, it would be two units or three units of power out here. So you're just, it's weakening, as I understand it, it's weakening the um, the signal across the pattern. It's not changing the pattern. It's not shrinking the pattern down to be a, a different pattern totally. That's great. Yeah, okay. that, 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 that's absolutely correct. Yeah. All right. Cool. So that's antennas. That's radiation patterns. I think we we nailed that, and that was something that we wanted to do. So now I've got this idea of of cables. And one thing I think uh, we had talked about was I talked about calculating loss. You can calculate that almost anywhere. I'll probably put a link in the show notes, but you probably have a calculator on the RF shop dot what is it RF shop dot com dot AU. AU. Yeah. Yeah. So you can calculate your loss there. You just put in, hey, I'm I'm running at nine fifteen yeah, or. That, that's correct. There's, there's plenty of um, tables out there. And fortunately, 900 megahertz was always um, historically a, a value that's in the table as well. So it's quite easy to get a good estimate of, of what you can expect just by going by, by length. 
Cool. And then the big one is, does, does cable loss affect um, transmit power and receive sensitivity, which are two different things. Like we're blasting things out on the transmit side and the power side, and we're really listening on the uh, receive side. Does cable loss affect those things in the same way? Um, yes and no. It's, it's quite a quite an interesting one. Um, of course, the, the gut feel is it does exactly the same. And it, indeed, it adds a lot of problems. Um, also, when, as you mentioned, with just basic units, so five to two. So when you transmit, and, and I think everybody's familiar with that concept because you have to put that in your um, settings when you, when you set yep. up your antenna on your minor. But when you receive, the same happens. You basically lose um, a lot of power as you go through a long cable. Um, but the other thing that happens is the um, it, just in the calculations that we use for signal to noise, it actually is almost like a um, it adds noise. Now it doesn't really add noise; it's just the, it has a noise figure. So the more you 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 add cable losses, the, the, the noise floor doesn't really get changed. It's not like you have attenuation, so your noise floor also drops. It's basically you have a signal. Or there's a, there's noise. I mean, the ambient noise, temperature noise, um, just there's always noise involved in radio comms as, yep. as with um, anything else that that's there your signal is there if, you, if you're lucky it's a positive number so your signal is stronger than your noise and then you have a really good um uh link mm -hmm. but as you get cable losses that that drops lower and lower but the noise floor stays there so suddenly the difference between what 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 your radio can pick up and the noise floor gets less and less and it gets harder and harder to get a good link going um and that's the key thing for me is that it has a noise noise figure and the noise figure is that losses and you want to eliminate that. So if you can get your cable as short as possible from a receive perspective, it's just going to help you all the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's I hadn't thought of that. So the, the noise is always there. The noise is always at whatever level it is, more or less. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. as the signal goes down, the ratio between signal and noise that the SNR changes can change Correct. dramatically. Correct. And that, that, that's the key thing. It's just we go on Helium Explorer. Um, you have three numbers that I actually find really interesting is your your distance, your um, RSSI, your signal strength, and you have your SNR. Um, they, the, those two all will get affected. The, um, the, the RSSI is the obvious one that will drop, but your signal to noise will also weaken. Um, and it's yeah, just try to limit the cable length as much as you can. As I said, it is a practical consideration. If, yeah. you, if you can't go shorter than a certain length, that is what it is, um, unless you can move your minor. Right, and then it's it's just a question of putting in the gain and putting in the cable loss and figuring out what's gonna what's gonna work for you. Mm -hmm. So I was I think I used to think of it as the this is my very rough rule of thumb is that the cable loss shouldn't exceed the gain of the antenna, but that's probably not right. It's just like semi useful. So if you had like a three dBi gain, you didn't want any more than three dBi of loss because I what I was thinking was that. The miner is pushing out what the miner is pushing out. That's what the manufacturer intended. As long as that power coming out at the end of the day is close to what the manufacturer intended, it's probably okay. I'm not sure how true that is or, or useful that is. What, what, I think what do you think good, of that? It's a very useful rule of thumb. Um, I, I don't know yeah, if, if anybody watches our channel. I, I started saying you know, my intro is keep it simple, keep it real. Yeah, I think that's a very good way to say keep it simple, and that's an excellent um, just rule of thumb. Um, okay. If, if, yeah. Ah, lucky again. Cool. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. So then the next thing is, is, is there any, like what, I guess, what cable is best for helium miners? Cause everybody just wants an answer. Like what's, what's the best cable? Um, yeah, I'm not going to go against the main, mainstream on this one because that would be um, <laughs> social media suicide. Yeah. Um, I do agree with LMR 400, and I okay. but I have to admit, or LMR or 400 series. Let's let's put it that just into context a little bit. Super good point. Yeah. Um, the thing with the 400 or that the whole range of cables, it actually is kind of just a ratio of the size of the cable. That's how they got to those numbers. So hmm. if the hundred is 0 0.1 of an inch. 400 is 0.4 of an inch and you can just mentally immediately see all those numbers what does it mean it's a fraction of an inch so and the bigger it goes the lower the losses um and for helium that's all you really need to worry about mm -hmm. when we as as a like, we, we do cables uh, yeah, a heck of a lot i would say then the frequency becomes important because the bigger the cable the lower the frequency cut, cut off frequency we can't use say lmr um, 900 at 5.8 gig anymore because 
things just go. Huh. There's all sorts of other things that start to play play okay. at role uh, well there. But 900 megahertz with helium, that's that that doesn't affect the um that that project. So that's good. Um, so the 400 is a good number, and I, I must admit when I got myself involved into helium, I was still thinking a lot about the 4G point of reference for what how I see the world. Yep. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, actually, I realized, and this is, I think, quite important for a lot of people to understand, that we are not end users. We are building the network. So you really want to do the best you can to build the network. And that's where a small cable like this stuff is probably just not a good idea because you don't build a, a cellular network using this cable. You, you use decent stuff. Yeah. And that's why I shifted my thinking as well when I said, this is actually, you want to just make sure that you do the right thing. Of course, people want to earn h and and they want to get as many witnesses, which is the real um, tangible um, way that people get the incentive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it kind of fortunately, um, but they both help the same cause. Um, but I would wouldn't shy away from going for cheaper, nasty cable just because you are in a in a dense population. I, I saw somebody on Facebook yesterday asking what what can you do with his miner if he sets it up in um, New York City. A lot of people say, well, you're better off just selling it because there's so many people there. But even there, you're better off getting a good cable and getting a good setup if it's a very dense area already because it helps the network and it helps your 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 rewards, your your earnings as well. Yeah, I, from a network perspective, like the best thing to do with a miner in New York is move. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, mean, I, I can imagine that. I'm, I'm south of Adelaide, so at the moment I have 14 witnesses and I'm ecstatic because it's so sparsely populated. I could see everyone that's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, New York City is a, is a very, very different game. It's a bad example. Affected... It's, it's probably the worst of the worst. Of it. Yeah, example. New York or San Francisco. It's uh, it's interesting because there is that layer of, of incentivization on top of the RF stuff. So you got to understand HIP 15 and HIP 17 and how the hexes work and the different size resolutions and mm. and all that stuff. But we're going to stick with um, the cable right now. So I guess the, the next question is, is there a big difference between LMR 400 and any other XYZ 400? There are other kind of 400 cables out there where it's like, oh, yeah, it's totally fine to get those. Or is it like, no, no, stick with stick with the name brand stuff? Um. So, I mean, we, we, we have an alternative as well, and we call it respectfully an equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, we have been doing the one that we sell for six years. So I, I, I'm very confident in the art of performance. And I think I can always mentally build a, a, a matrix of, of what the differences are for me from, yep. from my perspective. If you look at LMR and, and some of the other you know, big brands, basically, um, it's Times Microwave that created LMR. Yep. And, and they are the first ones out. So when we now talk about Google, whenever we do search engines, but there are other options as well. So yep. it's a little bit of, it's the one that, that is the most common and most well known. But I do have to respectfully say as well that with Times Microwave, you actually have many options in the LMR range as well. So um, I just had a few here. So we have an Ultraflex, you have a, a DB, you have a, um, a fire, re fire retardant one. So in the jacket, there are differences between the qualities of lots of these cables. Yep. The one that yep. is common in helium is LMR 400, and it's the straight one. So yep. just solid center core. It's the um, the dielectric, which is sort of foam-based, and then the jacket itself is a, a PE-based, which is just a type of plastic that they use. Yep. Um, a lot of times you need to use Ultraflex. The, the, the difference between a solid core and the Ultraflex is that the, um, the center conductor is not a solid, it's mm -hmm. actually lots of strands that build up a single solid, so semi-solid um, copper copper link. They are more lossy. Um, that's the downside because it's not a smooth surface. So the radio waves do actually get attenuated in those those little um, windings inside. Huh. But it is better for vibrating environments. Um, think about trains or um, vehicles, cars, um, airplanes. So you need to use Ultraflex in certain in instances. Some places. Yes, um, but for helium, because it's a solid, it's your house, it's everything. You just go for the solid core, go for the fairly basic one. What I find with our cable, and I think with a lot of other ones, is the outer jacket is probably the difference. So PE mm -hmm. is what they use, uh, polyethylene, I think. Um, <laughs> you can check afterwards and put it in the Some description. Some polyethylene something, yeah. Yeah, so it's PE. And then our cable is for instance, PVC, the, um, this one. So okay. it's slightly different. If you look at the differences, there's a... In Australia and our deployment is perfectly fine, and I think it's when the cold weather comes in, you need to see which one is going to be best for me. Ah, uh, okay. So you got to pay attention to operating temperature. temperature. All right. Yeah, 
But the radio wise, performance wise, it, it's all the same. So you don't lose more by going for cheaper ones. But there are obviously exceptions to the rule. I'm, I'm just referring to the ones I, I'm, I'm comfortable yeah. with. And we did go through a few tests. Um, we, we, we've we evaluated once. Um, another thing that, that came to mind is how flexible is the cable. For yeah. us, this one is quite very, uh, it's quite flexible, actually. So we stuck with this one and we we're using this one. There are other brands out there and kind of even on paper, you don't know. You have to get samples in and play with it and see how much work is it to, to build a cable, put a connector on them. Yeah. Um, so there are differences, yes. Um, um, it's very conf- If somebody keeps selling the same alternative and they seem to be comfortable with it, I, I wouldn't dismiss that idea. Um Okay, so there's, there's about myself yeah. and other companies yeah. as well. Yeah. It's so it's a little bit kind of horses for courses, but it's also they're all probably pretty close to the same when it comes to performance. The big thing I see is if you need to snake it around some crazy corner, or if it's on some yeah. vibrating thing, which helium people yeah. generally aren't doing. Um, maybe yeah. look for different stuff, or if you're in a super cold environment, find stick with the the times. Yeah, or the, the LMR stuff. And, and- yeah. And also very moist. And that's the other thing, water, water penetration. And if this thing often gets gets placed in water or you see it's going to be damned at times mark, then you wouldn't go for the LMR straight. There's a LMR DB, um, which actually there's, there's, they have better water um, sort of tension, um, protection, basically. So okay. it gets very, very mechanical. Yeah, but so is that is that like um, kind of when you're talking about a, a ton of water, is that rainfall or is that more like, hey, this is in a marine environment and there's going to be water all the time um or unknown that is a good question and i think i've i've been in the um the the tropical north of of australia a few weeks ago and when it's so damp and everything is wet and the humidity is high yeah there's 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 a lot of things to think about in terms of there's so much water and just it's just always wet yeah that that um you need to consider that i mean yeah adelaide will try i think it's probably similar climate to what, what you have in, in San Diego. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the perfect it's, climate. It's, it's quite easy. For us, it's easy to say no, not too many issues say. Yeah, that's a good point. Is that is early on when I was writing about this stuff before <laughs> as silly as it sounds, before I became the Gristle King. I was just like, well, because it works in San Diego, it's gonna work everywhere. And then I found that people mm-hmm. in Canada have in Texas have very different challenges than we do. We've got perfect mm-hmm. weather and yeah, yes. it's it's uh different things you need to do. Okay. The other thing I see a ton of is it's like this, it's a cable that is round and then it goes to a flat section to get through a window. So yeah. you, people use this cause they're in an apartment, they apartment or a house. They can't drill a hole in the wall. They don't want to for whatever reason. So they're just going to run the antenna cable, not the ethernet cable, but the antenna cable, um, under the window. Is there like, what are the down downsides of having a flat coax cable? I, personally need to open up one of those okay. i'm gonna say it out, out loud here really yeah. um i need to see what's going on in there because my only point of reference for flat coaxial ca- no it is not coaxial that's the whole thing it's basically a two wire transmission line um but you always have fields between the two points so yeah. this is we're talking about rf we're not talking about dc so it's not just there's current flowing and there's a return current or something like that there's actually a field around your device so in coax you basically have your center conductor and you have the outer conductor and it's not like in rf world we we look at the, the current that's flowing in the conductor or in the copper mm-hmm. it's the fields in between that is important to us uh. with the um, twin line that it is a twin line top cable there's fields around it. My biggest concern with those, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking from my, my firm opinion here. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit outspoken against those, to, to be bluntly honest. Sure. Um, if you put it in a window, you're just interfering with that whole um, cable design. So you are causing a lot of trouble. Now, if it's a wooden frame, it's bad, but it's probably, if people say it still works. So I'm, I'm not going to say it can't work because obviously you're just changing the fields. You're changing the characteristics of your cable at that point. Yep. which transfers to losses. Losses transfers to weaker con- connections. So, yes, it's going to ha- hurt. If it's a metal frame, that'll be terrible because you have this metal window that you're putting on top of it. So you're basically almost creating a, a sort of a short for your radio waves okay. that you jam this cable through. So I'm not a fan, um, to, to be blunt. For no, I'm, I'm with it. I mean, I always look at this stuff, and, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm elitist with it, whatever, as far as just like doing, doing a great mm-hmm. job. But I think... Here's the helium miner that you spent whatever five hundred or thousand bucks on. Yeah. Mm. Here's the antenna that you spent another hundred bucks on, mm. um, and you want this thing to return 
maximum HNT is yeah. finish it off with a rad install. Like don't leave yeah, it definitely. inside. Don't like get it sort of on your roof. Like be fucking crazy. Get the thing as high as possible. Don't worry about what anyone says. Get the thing. So it's like, it's providing the best coverage you can do. You've already taken all the other steps and like, finish it off. Right. But yes. that's, oh, yeah. Yeah. that's me. And I'm lucky I got my own house. I can do whatever I want. I know that not everyone has that same position. You're in an apartment, you're in someone else's house. They don't want you to do that. Like that's not reasonable. Um, mm-hmm. But Luckily, I found being unreasonable to be a winning strategy. <laughs> I, so far. I, I, I guess uh, talking about my own experience, like I think so many, you get a helium miner, you're so excited. That that's what I did at home. I mean, you, yeah. you powered us up first, and I just took the stock and ten. I just want to see how yeah. can this work, which was okay. But now, and I'm going to do a video a bit later today, actually, about this. That the difference between when I just had this stock antenna, I'm not, nothing against this thing, but it was just on my windowsill. Yeah. And then when I got the proper antenna on the roof at a good height and I have a good view of the city, you know, I mean, it's just phenomenal. It's You, you want to do the right thing for yourself and for the network. Yeah. Just do and, it. And, and most of those two me. things line up. Yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's talk about kind of typical connectors. So on the... The thinner yep. cable, the 240 stuff, we see SMA and RPSMA. And mm-hmm. then on the thicker stuff, you can go up to the um, end types. Do you want to walk me through what the difference is on there? And yeah, what's, what's uh, going on with them? Yeah, it was, it's different range of connectors, really. So SMA connector is, uh, it gets used a heck of a lot in, in all sorts of applications. It's yep. a common connector. It's a very easy one to use. Yep. The, 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 the bugger, I guess, if I can use that word, is is that you have this RP SMA. And, and I think a lot of people who for the first time use helium, they don't know that there is such a thing as not having an RP in front of the SMA um, words. Right. It's reverse polarity. So in it's actually in the unlicensed band. So the um, Laura Wan is using an ISM or the unlicensed band, like 2.4, 5.8 Wi-Fi. They're all unlicensed. So it's not like somebody who owns that spectrum needs to control who uses the connector Um, and for that reason they they decided let's do a slightly different tweak to the connector and they came up with a brilliant idea 20 years ago and i'm saying that very sarcastically um to go use the same connector just change the gender on the inside from male to female so it has nothing to do reverse polarity has nothing to do with radio waves looking like this and then going like this or all sorts of it's not over complicated it's really just you have this thing if you look at it from this perspective, just, just from the outside, it looks exactly the same as a conventional SMA. Yep. You try to put the two together. If it's two males, it kind of, you just, just potentially damage the thing. Yep. If you have two, or if you have two females on the inside, but one yep. is a male nut, the other one is a female body, yep. you don't get a connection. And yep. um, I'm sure every guy and and girl that has done antenna tests once in their life would have two females and it all looks together and the system just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it drives you nuts. No, it's, it's frustrating. It's... <laughs> it is. So that's SMA and they're small. Um, normally the gold color, and I know, yeah, if I turn it like this, you can see it is gold. Yeah. Um, you do get silver versions as well. And uh, I actually happen to have silver on the um, bigger cable as well. So it's still a big cable, but the connector then is just much smaller at the end. That's... Um, that's the reverse polarity SMA. That's the okay. male, but the female body. Yep. Then that connects straight to your minor. So most minors, um, I say that most because now we see mile site came out and they use end connectors. So there is now the exclusion to the rule where some some minors use end type connectors. But yep. most minors would use the um, female body of this, and then you just plug the RP SMA onto that. Um, the other side is the end connector. So you, you get end male, which is actually a really awesome connector to use because it's quite easy it's it's easy in the field where you can just um um you know finger tight finger yep. tight is good yeah enough. you don't need some fancy wrench yeah enough. totally no um most antennas um if you look at the mcgills or most of the other antennas that the those ones seem to have this connector so an yeah. male on them so yep. you can basically say there's my antenna i put that on yep. then to connect to that you would use the um female so yep. it's and again it's it's a biggish connector that you can then connect onto that and it's finger tight so it's good and well finger tight and not not just loosely but but you don't go go over yeah tight top. that thing down i've i've had more than one time where i didn't tighten it i was like oh that, it feels pretty tight it's good enough and i got back home and checked it and realized yeah. that it wasn't tight enough and a quarter no. quarter of a turn is what makes a difference mm, mm, mm. Great, so. great. yes um 
I don't know if I could quickly deviate. So there's another question we get a lot is um, what is bulk it? Um, and in uh, antenna world, people know bulk it or non bulk it, what that means. But now we get a lot of inquiries that people say, well, who cares? What, what, what the hell are you talking about? So bulk it is the ex extra nut at the back. So um, if I just go a little bit closer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that extra flange that you have there, it's an option. It doesn't really cost us anything. So it doesn't cost customers anything to have that extra. Yeah. What this allows you is if you have a panel, you have a mount, or maybe we were just talking about um, the, um, the flat cable. Yeah. If you could just get a nice setup where you have a nice little hole yep. and this goes through that. So you have this, just, just the um, one section that then penetrates through and you have a nice clean connection on the other side you can yep. connect the cable to. It, it makes for a very elegant and, and neat finish. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's a problem because if people want to feed this cable through a conduit um, and that nut is just too big, they say, well, I actually wanted an inline connector, then you don't want bulk it. So that's where the difference is. Mm -hmm. Majority of times it doesn't matter. People take one or the other, say, well, don't care. I just make a connection between two cables, and that's perfect. Yeah. Um, well, we learned the hard way with the RF shop. If you don't ask, then it's probably the other one. So people who we ask for, <laughs> be patient because we're asking, because the one time we don't ask is the time that people say, oh, this doesn't fit anymore because this thing is too big. So yep. that's what it means. And yeah, that's yeah, the reason yeah. why. Yeah, from my Navy days, a bulkhead is that's what you call a wall, and it's this thing that just goes like that, that's the way I remember mm -hmm. it. Is it, it's a thing that goes through a, neat, a wall, yeah. however, um, mm -hmm. however thin that is. And then all those bulkhead connections, they usually have that little red plastic or whatever o ring on the inside. Um, mm -hmm. in San Diego, I've been lucky enough to just use that as my waterproofing. Maybe that's not mm -hmm. good enough in, in actual rainy areas, but um, yeah, yeah, is there yeah any... that, 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 that is a good point. Um, the the, the cheaper ones cheap not not in a negative way because i mean this is what we do as well the, yeah. the radius as you say perfectly fine and same in adelaide that that, that works quite well yeah. um the more expensive ones you often see they actually just have a proper silicone o-ring so yeah this is just the it actually is flat this one isn't round so you can oh, okay. see the difference just that it's a nice o-ring proper one and then it, it it seals yeah ip67 yeah 60, i haven't had any problems with mine so hmm. But it, it um, rains like four days a year here, so maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe my dad is, yeah, uh, is a little corrupt. <laughs> um, one thing that I actually thought of saying, which um, probably was more relevant when I spoke about the, uh, the jackets, yep. um, in the mining industry, we often get the um, question that people want a nylon condu conduit. So it's okay. quite good, actually. It works really well, and it's something you could buy on DigiKey or some of those, those stores. So mm -hmm. if somebody wants to use... A conduit to protect whatever cable they have, the um the nylon conduits work works a treat. Um, so and it can can be terminated, so you can have the um kind of to just seal it up at the end, so that it's waterproof. Um, another interesting one we have in Australia, probably in the US as well, is bird proofing or just bird protection, because mm -hmm. they they if you have cable exposed, yeah, and there's a some some I don't know what birds they they just love whatever you do, and they very they take a lot of interest in the rubber. Huh. So. Maybe bird protection is something if it's, as I said, because we are building an infrastructure. Yeah. Um, if this thing needs to stand there for five to 10 years, and there is a likelihood that birds are going to cause trouble, not, not, not by, you know, just. Um, like they just come down and peck on the antenna and rip things off. We got crows mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And that's where the nylon conduit could work well. Okay. But just don't use metal conduit. Is that, or does it? Well, no, no, that could work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So metal yeah. conduit, no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, are those are those two connectors? Is there a giant difference in loss between an N type and an SMA or RPSMA? Or not enough um, to worry about? At nine hundred megahertz, it is okay, but you do get manufacturers and you get manufacturers, and I've had really bad connectors. So I think it's worth making sure that whoever supplies you the cable seems reputable in whatever market you're in and in yep. helium i mean you have a few names people seem to be comfortable with those use that don't don't just jump onto the nearest website without naming any websites and just buy whatever you could find that's the cheapest because you can get bad connectors really um bad connectors one thing that is very critical um you mentioned that earlier is it's actually an interface between connectors so it, it, we're talking about radio waves and it's physics moving from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a small c connector and mm -hmm. a small cable, often the transition between the two is fairly manageable and quite good. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a big connector, like an N-type connector, there's, you could see what companies do a good job and which ones don't do a good job. Because you have a big connector, 
transitioning suddenly into a small cable. Mm. If the antenna, or sorry, cable manufacturer or connector manufacturer doesn't do a good job at that interface, that that could really cause a lot of trouble. So I wouldn't go for a cheap, small cable with a big connector unless you know where you're buying it from, to be honest. Okay, because I've been doing the last couple ones I did, yeah. uh, I you know took out the basically I ran a UFL to N type. So it's like this tiny little wire going mm. to this mm. giant connector. And you're saying yes. maybe pay attention to where you're getting this from. Huh. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And then the UFLs often is a, even a smaller cable that, that probably it's told tiny. you one seven eight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the that, UFL is the connector on the minor, so you, you have to deal correct. with that. That's correct, correct. Yeah. Yeah. I don't and think we use the like... same connector on Wi Fi and 4G as well, the yeah. UFL stuff. And there's no UFL connector straight to LMR 400. <laughs> <laughs> we we have I've a seen. custom cable builder on our website, and, and initially we had um, that option. And then yeah. people were giving me a lot of um, sticks saying, oh, I, I want to see your UFL connector on your uh, CLA 400. So, okay, we have to fix this because. Now, the biggest we could find is RG316, which is kind of this three millimeter diameter. Yep. That, that's the biggest going into UFL. And not bad because the smaller cables is just going to get worse. So I like to go if it's practical. I think the limitation for me is their practicality. So if it's mechanically possible to make that bend inside your miner, because now you're looking at a small box and you really yep. have to go tight bends, um, that, that's becoming the bigger issue than the losses there yeah. for me. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see. We both get questions about reusing other cable. Um, but like, can I use 75 ohm TV cable? Is that going to be good? Like I've got it laying around my house. Can I use it? And I've always told people, no, uh, for us, we're using 50 ohm. I, I know there's a difference. I know one of them doesn't work, but I don't know why or, or how bad it is if you use one over the other. Um, yeah, I, I did a video on that last week actually as well. Um, okay. I got to catch up on the, your channel. Um, but... Yeah. <laughs> the, um, First of all, that the seventy-five fifty ohm is a massive thing. So okay. definitely, that that's that's the first answer is that, that it's not going to work. It's not a good idea. Don't um, ignore that. Okay. There are ways to explain why. Um, the impedance is the biggest issue. So there's a massive step between the two. Actually, the same problem that 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 discontinuity, but it's a physical impedance problem. So you're going to have reflections at that junction from the fifty ohm to the seventy-five ohm. Hmm. The the the, the the second problem is it's going to happen again on the other side of the cable as well. Right. So you, you, you're just creating a lot of headaches and losses would be yeah, really bad. Yeah, um, and when you think about it, like a cable isn't that much to buy a new cable. Even if you get 100 feet of badass LMR 400, you're still looking at, I don't know, less than 150 bucks probably. Yeah. It comes back to that same point that it's, it's worth investing that little bit extra because that could make or break the whole um, outcome. Cool. Yeah. Is there um, anything, I think we've got, um, the one, the last question I've got, and then we can, if you have anything else, we can add it on top is, does it matter if the cable gets uh, dinged, if it's got any bumps or breaks or creases or anything, is that something where you look at it and you're like, dude, I got to replace this or, hmm. or that um, doesn't matter. It, it comes to the same question about reusing old cable to me. Um, a cable is coaxial. So it is round and the design is meant to be round. If a cable is, dented there's something happening at that point and there's a there's not a smooth flow of the, i mean that's why i keep referring to to flowing and and rivers and stuff mm. it's going to be losses through that point it's going to cause issues and it could be minimal but it could be significant if you don't know i think it's play it play it safe and rather say that it's not worth it let's let's get a get get this fixed and, and replace the um yeah. the cable where, where you see that that obvious damage Dig it. That's all I've got for the cable stuff. That's, that's super helpful for me just to walk through and mm. and hear that stuff myself. And also, if, hopefully, for people watching this who have the cable questions, mm. I think we've hit the big ones. Is there anything else before we sign off that you want to make sure people know about cable and, and helium? Um, no, we. I, I think the simple, just a, a very simple remark is that there's a, actually also a cable out there, RG400. Mm -hmm. um, do not be confused because it's a different cable. And, and you got to love some of these um, people that come up with codes and names. They, right. they didn't think right. this through properly, but right. <laughs> RG400 is not LMR400 or CLF or LCU, whatever code there is. RG400 is a cable type, and it's lower. It's much higher loss. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually high-end cable. It gets used in actually pretty high-end applications mm -hmm. for other reasons, not for the reason we want in Helium. So RG400 is not the correct cable to use okay. if you want to get better performance 
little hot tip at the end for you. Don't do RG400. Mm. Yeah. Ripping. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for coming on. Super good to have you on. Always enjoy sharing your knowledge with the world. Um, and then if anyone has questions, or especially if you're in Australia and you want to buy cable, go to the rfshop.com.au. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Appreciate it. Ripping. All right.